Jasmine, tell us about this project and how it began. We're so thrilled to be sharing it with our Hartford stage audiences. Melia, I think it's so critical that this project um, actually came out of Long Wharf Theater reaching out to me and saying, Jasmine, we have some money. What do you want to do with it? Yeah. <laughs> because Good. I think part of this is that I don't hear that. I don't, I haven't had the experience as a, an independent curator, producer, director, uh, you know, somebody who's pulling from and working with many different types of, you know, multidisciplinary artists across the state of Connecticut. I don't get that. I've had to really piece together money to be able to, to produce a project. So for Longworth Theater to say, hey, you know, we've worked with you in the past. We love the way that you work with folks. We love, you know, um, kind of how you work with local talent. Um, what do you want to do? And it took me and, and that, because that question doesn't come to me often, I was like, oh, let me actually sit and marinate on this. You know, we've had 2020 was a very creatively stagnant year for me. Um, and I, I had to go back to a lot of basics and grounding techniques for myself to just be like, what do I need for me to survive, to feel whole, to feel connected to my community? Um, and, and so, it took me a while to actually marinate and ponder and, and dream up, what did I even wanna do with this kind of open-endedness of here's a space, here's some money, what do you wanna create? Um, and, you know, I, I had been reading this book. We we'll do the show book. and tell of our books. <laughs> oh, I can't, you know, but it's so wonderful. I love how we have I love how we have different versions of it. Do. Um, I have the hardcover from the library. So thank you, Hartford Public Library. Yeah. Awesome. I didn't, that's awesome that they have it. This book was given to me uh, by an old vecina neighbor of mine um, that I remember her reading from the, like the beginning of it and being like, what is this book? This book is about me and my ancestors. Um, and in the prologue, it literally has it's entitled Jed Babruja. And it talks about this plant um, and the author Aurora, uh, Aurora Levins Morales experience with this plant, um, you know, as a child. And, and, and they would almost play with it and poke at it. And their experience with it still being able to flourish and grow in the places in which it was punctured. Um, and, and the way there's a description in here too, where she describes that like a coven gathered around their wounded elder, the seedlings always grew in a circle, marking the place where the long decayed leaf had lain. And, and it was like, and she uses this plant as a metaphor um, for the story of survival of uh, the all the different ancestors that make up Puerto Rican women um, through the generations and generations. Um, and something just really struck me about this plant and um, that through the harshest of conditions, through literally like the, the, the attempted genocide of this plant, that it survived, that it survived, that it thrived, that it grew in places of, of, of trauma. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was like, yo, what if we created a production and a piece that used this as a metaphor, not just for, you know, the ancestors of Puerto Rican women, which I identify with, um, but the ancestors of the African diaspora, the ancestors of, of indigenous peoples and, um, um, you know, through many attempted um, genocides and enslavement and all these different things. Um, and, and that not only was it an independent survival, but it was a collective one. And that in fact, it was the, the collective that created spaces in order um, for folks and for generations to survive. Um, and so, sorry, this was like a long description. No, this is wonderful. And it connects completely to, to the feeling the work emanates. I'm excited that that's true. It does. It does. I swear it, it, it's connected. What you're, what you're saying, what you built the ground for 
what you grounded, if if I, you know, in terms of just the rituals that frame it, yeah. feel very much like they're about regrounding and surviving through yeah. a pandemic in a in an empty theater, right? I mean, it, it's a it, there's a lot uh, there's a lot that's really evocative about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and so um, I don't know if you want me to tell you kind of about the creative process. About yeah, it. a little bit. I mean, I would also love to, you know, I would just throw in, too, that what's so amazing to me about seeing it um, and it resonated for me of something in um, in Remedios is when she talks about the wounding and healing of nations is not different from the wounding and healing of individuals. And so I just wanted to really sort of amplify that because I feel like that's, I, that is one thing I took away from the piece is how much when you're talking about your own experience and needing to kind of refresh your soul with the work, that that is kind of a national need right now. Mm -hmm. So um, how did you approach the people who are part of the piece with you? Is that, was that, I mean, is, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, it, so part of my creative process is like, is really taking my time to dream up, not only just the concept, but then who, who, who needs to be part of this? Who would I love to see being part of this? Um, what are the components? What is the structure that I want to offer? And uh, something for me, Maria, that I have been growing into and, and coming into an understanding every creative project that I am a part of is my role as a curator. Um, I, you know, I had been stumbling upon more information about curanderas. Same. And so as, you know, as healers, um, what, are, what are the different um, elements that healers are bringing into the space to to invite somebody in to make them feel like they can um, share what their ailments are, share what's going on in their lives, and then be able to support them with those ingredients. And um, and so I've been thinking about that, like how do I invite people? How do I welcome people in? Um, and I know that I'm not doing this alone. I know that I come from actually a lineage of curanderas that I've been learning about. Um, and so I'm like, who, who needs to come into this space? And, and, and honestly, Melia, a lot of the collaborations that I end up putting together, which are folks that have never worked with each other before. So you do the matchmaking, right? I do the matchmaking. <laughs> I do the matchmaking and it's always folks that primarily have never met or have never worked with each other before. Because me, for me, it's about the creative process and not just the product. And I want to build our Connecticut artist community. So I'm trying to connect folks from Hartford to New Haven, right. from Waterbury to New Haven. To well, New Haven. That's, no. we're thrilled to join Long Wharf <laughs> in, in presenting you for exactly that reason. Yeah. it's. And, and I, I literally want these folks to be friends, having to be, to say yes and to be essentially forced, but also say yes to the yeah. invitation of creatively working with somebody um, is, gives you the possibility of building a friendship and building a relationship. Um, and so like the producers, Zulu and Paul, which by the way, were the first uh, male, you know, men that I've worked with or put out there as performers, you know, cis men, straight men, you know, that were out there in my in my show are both producers that I've never met each other before, have worked in music creation. Um, Yexandra um, Diaz is uh, a, a Boricua that was born in Chicago, but grew up in New Haven, uh, that is living in New Haven, based in New Haven, a spoken word artist. Um, but what I was, what I had learned, because this invitation also comes with the, with the invitation of experimentation, um, which is really critical for me. How do I, and I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place. No, but this is terrific. <laughs> how do I invite folks and give enough structure, which might include, this is how much, you know, I can offer you for pay. This is how much we can offer for, you know, supplies or right. whatever it might be. Um, 
I also had put forth a, 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 a vision for the altars and the use of the altars in the space, which I, which I can talk a little bit more about. Um, but it's also- so that was with, you, you started, cause that really does center the piece around the altar and the beginning and the end of it around it, yeah. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that, um, but besides the structure, I want to hold this space for folks to be curious with each other, to play with each other, to experiment, to do something that they actually have never done before. And I so, love that. I love that it's about experimenting in the creation. And so in that, the um, partner for with Yex is Jaslyn Council. She's a she's known as a DJ in the community, um, DJ Shavarda. Uh, but she emerges as a dancer, and, and a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> she emerges, you know, in this movement. She surrendered. Yeah. yeah. And and. Um, Yexandra was like, oh, I actually have a foundation in ballet, you know, and then she she pulled out her bomba skills in it. And and so I wanted folks to get this, to put to use the Jebba right. as as a metaphor, but then to just explore what that is and to have a safe enough, warm enough space for them to explore. Um, Can so I, I no, it's fabulous. I mean, you're so, when I first, I met you when I first came to Hartford, what seems like decades ago, it's less than two years, and you did a beautiful job. I just want to shout out the work you've done for Hartford Stage historically in the last few years, and I'm particularly grateful for your extraordinary curation of the Quixote Nuevo visual of our art gallery on the upper lobby, because the, uh, uh, the assembly of these extraordinary uh, Latinx artists and their work was one of the most moving elements to me of that production. So I'm very grateful to you and your curating skills in all senses of the word. This strikes me as so challenging in the sense that you're used to working in live performance. You make these events, right? You make Sage Seeker is so renowned in this region for creating events where I think you're in direct communication with an audience. So what was it like to make this work in an empty theater? You know, um, it's different. It's not live theater. It's not live performance. Um, there is very much an aspect of liveness that's happening. Um, the performers rehearsed, you know, they went through a creation process, they rehearsed, um, you know, we did have to pull in lighting and consider sound and, um, you know, we, and we built the altars um, in the space, which is actually the first time I've ever participating in, in help, you know, visioning and then working with Building. the designer yeah. and working with, you know, fabricators from Long Wharf to actually create those things. Um, that were so incredible. Um, and, and I think what happens with film is that we actually have the opportunity to get up close and personal with performers um, and take multiple angles and take, if we needed to take a couple of um, cuts, we, you know, um, takes we did. Although most, for the most part, these folks did like one take. <laughs> And they were done because they are used to live performance. Right. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to breathe. If there's like a scene that we want to do and then we want to cut to another aspect of it, we have that opportunity to without having it, it be something that we have to consider for the audience. So will you do it again this way, do you think? Is it tempting to continue working this way? So... I, you know, I did a residency at the beginning of the year for the first time in my life too. This year is like, I don't even know what's happening. I'm doing a lot of firsts and, and trying things out and playing. And I myself actually had the camera in my hand and was filming um, a couple of collaborators that I had invited in. And I, I love it. You know, I think I do, I, I think that there's a different kind of opportunity that we can do with film. Um, and performance film. I'm somebody who loves watching NPR tiny desks. Um, and so like, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to experience so many um, amazing musicians and performers if it weren't for that kind of, that kind of platform. Um, and so 
So I think that there is something exciting about the possibility of film being able to reach so many more audiences globally that we wouldn't be able to in just a live performance experience. Um, you know, even with the tick, the ticket barriers, the the facility, you know, uh, transportation, all right. these factors. Um, so it's a different kind of accessibility that's that's interesting. And to me, I'm like, well, if we're gonna do it, let's let's tr let's attempt to film beautifully. You know, let's attempt to do this in in a something that's exciting and pleasing um, experience for the audience. Um, so who knows? I think that you know, I would love to continue to 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 work with film and see uh, what might be possible with that. I just I very much miss live performance and and absolutely need that as well. Me too. I'm glad the, our audiences get to see this incredibly creative project that you've created. So thank you.